First up is the latest film in the Bad Boys franchise, and it's called Bad Boys Ride or Die. And I would like to point out that this franchise absolutely wasted the title Bad Boys for Life on a previous entry. Maybe they didn't think they were going to get four of these, but come on, it's sitting right there. Bad Boys, the number four, life. Like, just go with it. So... Occasionally, I like to do this exercise where I have not seen the previous films in a film franchise, but I tap in and I go, can I watch this and will it make sense? And the good news is for Bad Boys Ride or Die, yeah, pretty much makes sense because you know exactly what you're going to get with this. You know, I'm sure there are plenty of references and callbacks, etc. that I was unaware of or missed, you know, because I had not been familiar with the remainder of the franchise. But, you know, there are plenty of other films where it's prohibitive because you are 10 films in and you just have no idea what's going on. The last time I think I did this exercise was with The Equalizer. And again, it was like, well, yeah, you know, I know what's going on. He's an assassin. Things are happening. The time I'm most grateful for engaging in this exercise was during Fast and Furious where I'd seen one and two and then skipped a bunch of them, hadn't seen any until seven, tapped back in and went, hell yeah, this is the greatest. And then I went back and watched them all. Will I be going back to watch the other Bad Boys films? Probably not. I'd consider watching the original. Somehow, just in the cultural zeitgeist, I missed out on these films. But, you know, clearly they're popular because we are on our fourth one. They star Will Smith and Martin Lawrence as a bunch of cops in Miami who are a duo and get into hijinks and are not the most orthodox of police officers and... Okay, fine. You know, whatever. It's an action thing. There's not a ton to this. Now, there were some points in this where, you know, my peers and I during the screening went, is this how they've always talked? And I had to go, I have no idea. Just some of the dialogue, not necessarily like colloquialisms, but just the the writing of it. I, I don't know. It was strange. And then there are some moments that they reference in the previous films where I could not tell if they were talking about things that were fantastical or referencing things like, I mean, I'll just bring it up. Somebody's like, blah, blah, blah. She's a witch. And I was like, is she a literal witch with superpowers or is she a witch in like, uh, you know, calling her a cruel name for a woman? Because it's not like the film doesn't swear. So I was just like, did I miss something completely? Because I am interested in that storyline. The action in this is fine. You know, there are some, I'm reticent to call this, but they did feel gimmicky action moments that I think some people, you know, in my screening were impressed by, which is cool. It just for me felt kind of video game-ish, honestly. And again, I always say this, I'm not knocking video games, but it's a different experience to play a video game versus to watch a movie because a video game is interactive. And I think when films rely on especially, you know, action perspectives that are more game-ish, it's a little hard to change gears there. Now, did I find this film funny? Because that is kind of what they are known for. Sometimes, I guess, you know, I think it was a little too absurdist, but also trying to be grounded. Like if they had just committed to the wildness of it, I would have been like, okay, fine. You know, I think the other challenge is you have Will Smith playing this role where sometimes usually he's the comedic relief type character, but then you've got Martin Lawrence, who is very much more so that. So having Will Smith trying to play the straight man, but also not because he wants to get his own jokes in can sometimes be a little distracting. You've also got Vanessa Hudgens, Alexander Ludwig, Paolo Nunez, Eric Dane, Joan Gruffid, Jacob Sicbio, Melanie Libbard, Tasha Smith, Tiffany Haddish, and Joey Pants. And of course, you have Jerry Bruckheimer returning as a producer. You know, I think my biggest note for this one, my biggest note for this is it needed to be about 30 minutes shorter. I think if this had been 30 minutes shorter and generally been about the same film, I would have been like, yeah, this was a really fun time at the theater. But because it kept dipping in and out of these kind of uh, serious moments and then try to balance these, you know, action sequence with these purely comedic ones, it just... It was trying to do too much, and I don't know if they were just afraid that this was the last one they were get, so like, let's pull out all the stops, or they were just like, we don't know how to edit ourselves. Again, I found parts of it funny, but it came in so late that I was like, okay, I guess, you know, and if it come in earlier, because if the film was a little shorter, I think it would have been much better. Do I think having a previous knowledge of the franchise would have like aggressively helped my enjoyment of this film? Probably not, honestly. I'm sure to a degree, but I, it's not like I was like, I had no idea what was going on. I can't believe this movie. I'm, You know, whatever it is. So if you really wanted to, you could start with this film or come into this film as is. If you're a huge fan of Bad Boys, I think you're going to have a good time because this is just the previous films to a degree, to my understanding, but also based on, you know, double checking things afterwards and talking to folks. I was like, yeah, okay, this is this is what you expect from a Bad Boys film. So in that sense... It won't disappoint, hopefully. Now, for me personally, again, 
evaluating it as just like if this was an action film and putting aside the fact that you know it is a fourth film in a series evaluating it as an individual film within a series I had an okay time I just see so much room for improvement that again does not have to do with me being unfamiliar with the rest of the films that I am going to give it overall a three out of five the next film I have is called Hitman and it is out on Netflix now and apparently it is loosely based on a true story and it's from director Richard Linklater, who I'm a pretty big fan of. This doesn't necessarily feel like his other work. So if you're going into this expecting something like A Scanner Darkly, no, that's not what's going to be happening here. Or Before Sunrise, right? Like Waking Life, all of these things. Before Sunset, he has done some really amazing films. And so this is not really there in the pantheon. I wouldn't say it's a bad film. I would just say kind of like with Bad Boys. Not really for me. It stars Glenn Powell and he plays Gary Johnson and again apparently there was a real man called Gary Johnson who did the things that I'm about to describe. He is a college professor slash teacher who is also a freelance worker for a police department and they use him as like a plant slash bait as a fictional hitman so people will contact this fictional hitman and be like hey I want to kill whatever and then they use that as evidence to be like this person is trying to premeditate murder. You know I did not realize that this is a thing that police departments employ but sure fine. I didn't learn that this was based on a true story until the very end of the film. And so I kept questioning that the entire time. But now that that has been revealed, and now that I did a little more research, I'm like, okay, fine. So I'm equipping you with that to help ground you because this is much like in a weird way, bad boys trying to be grounded to a degree. Now, Glenn Powell, this is if you're a Glenn Powell fan, you're gonna have a great time in this film because it's like a Glenn Powell acting showcase. I think the challenge here is Glenn Powell, charismatic attractive man now casting Glenn Powell as a man who's supposed to disappear generally and the reason that they can hire him and use him as this kind of decoy hitman is because he they call him like forgettable and all this stuff so they try and dress him down and he uses this nerdy voice when he's in his regular character and then like when the character within starts playing these hitmen there's always like a little variance between them and so then he gets to do kind of acting school showcase whatever and you know he's like he's a super redneck one because that's what that client was probably going to gravitate towards or he's like a a nondescript European hitman because that's what this client expects you know it feels like it just becomes a bunch of almost SNL sketches of Glenn Powell trying on costumes and doing these uh, different characters who all happen to be hitmen so that got a little tedious for me you know I think again if you really like him and his acting like it's a fun showcase for him but I was like okay we get the point now, where I think the movie actually started to shine is the introduction of Adria Arona's character, who plays a woman who comes into his life, and then he is interested in her, but obviously he has this sort of double life slash leading a ruse, and so the relationship between them is complicated, and I was like, oh, okay, so is this a romance? But the thing I was bumping up against is that there's so much setup, and they're trying to be like, no, look, Glenn's an everyman, and he looks like a normal person, and he dresses dorky. This isn't a very attractive human being who would, of course, stand out in a crowd and you'd, of course, clock him immediately if you saw his presence. That it takes too long to get to kind of the more interesting dynamic chemistry points. It also stars Austin Emilio, Retta, Sanjay Rao. And like I said, you know, I had an okay time watching it. I was not the audience for this, but I could see there being an audience for this. I think also knowing for me that Richard Linklater is the director of it, I was like, I kind of expect more out of you, dude. Now, for... It being available in your home on Netflix, that I will give it credit for because I think this is, you know, of their offerings in this field, maybe one of like the more decent ones, but I'm not running out there and being like, oh my God, you have to watch Hitman. However, after having seen something like Atlas a few weeks ago, I'm like, yeah, okay, Hitman's fine. I'm not going to strong recommend this, but I'm also not going to be like, hey, if you saw the trailer and you are into this film it's uh, terrible don't watch it no it's not terrible it just had a lot of potential and does not live up to it I think I mean the trouble is like I feel like Glenn Powell is miscast in this role because he is not forgettable and I guess that's a compliment to real him and I don't want to knock his chameleon acting skills but some people don't disappear into roles right that's just how it is like Tom Cruise is always Tom Cruise you're just watching different versions of the same character on screen Glenn Powell is a little more of the school of Tom Cruise which is why he was so good in Top Gun anyway Overall, I'm actually going to give this a 3.4 out of 5. I don't think it was terrible. If you're inclined to see it, I think you'll have a fine time. If you're not, you know, I think it's perfectly skippable at the end of the day. But do with that what you will. 
The next thing I have this week is a docuseries, and it's three episodes, and it's on Max, and it's called Renfair. The first episode is already out, and the second and third are both being released on Sunday, June 9th. And I saw the trailer for this, and I was like, I must watch this, because I think Renfairs are fascinating. I will fully acknowledge that as a small child, I was taken to them. You know, I'm not super involved in the culture. However, I have many friends who are deeply, deeply involved in Renaissance fairs. And so I'm just like, what is happening here? You know, I hear stories from them that are fascinating and wild. So I know that there is this whole branch of society that revolves around Renaissance fairs. And so I thought this was going to be more focused on maybe like the ground level participants and people who uh, are centered around it. This is not. This is about the people at the top of it. And particularly one person called George Coleman, who founded the Texas Renaissance Festival. Now, George Coleman, fascinating character. And I think for better and for worse, right, if you had set him in pretty much almost any industry, this still would have been a watchable thing because he is a fascinating human being. You know, I've heard this compared to Tiger King a little bit, maybe with a little less slash hopefully a lot less crime. But I don't think that's an incorrect comparison in terms of you are watching this one person who just has such a specific outlook on life. And people have kind of allowed it to succeed for whatever reason, you know, time, place, etc. George or King George, as he calls himself, uh, is considering abdicating the throne. I don't know how to describe this. He's considering selling the Renaissance Fair. And, you know, the people around him uh, do treat it like a family, a culture, a cult? Question mark? No, not a cult. It's not a cult. But they are so heavily invested in it. And there's politics involved in the vendors and the uh, attendees and the performers and all that stuff. And so watching them all kind of come together and center around this George character and this possible huge shakeup that's going to happen at the Renaissance Fair because he's considering selling it, you know, it's interesting. Like I said, this could in theory be set around any industry. I think it is slightly embellished by the fact that it is a, a you know, a medieval looking uh, setting. But, you know, ultimately, this is a little more Succession Tiger King than it is American Princess, which was a show that I my friends told me about that is about the ground level folks. It's a fictional show. But like, that was what I was expecting is kind of more of a soapy drama about, you know, oh, the knights are always such cads and everyone who works as a tavern wench is always being harassed by there's something like that. But it's not about that. And it's not even necessarily about turkey leg vendors, which I was bummed by. But it still is fascinating and seeing how earnestly invested this huge group of people are in this community and also this mini economy it's a really interesting thing to watch but again keep in mind this is not necessarily focused on the uh, medieval ish not even medieval whatever the renaissance aspects of it it's more about the interpolitics of what happens when somebody in charge of a business is considering stepping down so like i said the first part is available as of you know this episode being released and the next two episodes will be available on june 9th on max the very last thing i have to talk about is star wars the acolyte and yes i saved this to the end because yes i know how uh, uh, protective Star Wars fans can be. Uh, I say this as a huge Star Wars fan myself, but someone who goes, you know what? I like liking Star Wars, and I don't go to watch things to try and hate them. So, Star Wars The Acolyte takes place a hundred years before The Phantom Menace. So this is the earliest we have ever seen on screen uh, pretty much any Star Wars story. So in that sense... You don't actually have to have seen Star Wars at all to go into this. And I like the fact that, you know, this kind of harkens back to very direct storytelling. It's kind of good and evil, things we're used to, um, you know, Sith and Jedi theoretically in this. But who knows? Is it even the Sith? Not honestly sure. It stars Amanda Stenberg, Lee Jung Jae from Squid Game, Manny Jacinto, Carrie Ann Moss from The Matrix, Daphne Keene from Logan, Charlie Barnett, Jody Turner-Smith, Rebecca Henderson, Dean Charles Chapman, you know, great cast. It's really also nice to see people who we haven't seen like visually their type of person in Star Wars before. The first two episodes are already out at the time of this recording. Episode three for me is when I was like, oh, we are doing something we have not seen before in Star Wars. Hell yes, I am so in for this. I want to see where this is going. I want the world to be expanded in a way that and I hate to say this, I love the Skywalkers, but like doesn't involve the Skywalkers. I like seeing this lore play out. And this era for, you know, my fellow nerds and also to introduce to my new nerds, this era is between the High Republic and the kind of rise of the Empire. And the High Republic, it, you know, there's a lot of books about it. Uh, there's a lot of extended universe stuff. And so 
it's nice to see like a new chapter vision etc that doesn't relate to the characters we know before because then you don't have to do homework you don't have to have seen nine movies for something to make sense and I you know I, I think a lot of us have talked about this we talked about this in the round table but like we're feeling a little fatigued and you know you don't want to feel fatigued on something you love so getting to come into this and being like cool I didn't have to read 10 books and watch all the series and do etc in order to like know what's going on the story they're just going to feed it to me as is was just a really delightful experience. I think Amanda Stenberg is a star. I think she's great. I think she's amazing in this. You know, I I totally understand if vibe-wise it's not for you. The action is a little stylized. It's clearly heavily influenced by Hong Kong martial arts films. And also, much like the rest of Star Wars, Japanese cinema, samurai stories. In fact, I think this one is just being a little more overt with it than some of the other stuff we've seen. You know, George Lucas, creator of Star Wars himself has been, you know, very open about Samurai and, and Kurosawa and all this stuff. Dave Filoni, same thing. So uh, Leslie Headland, who is the creator of this one, following in those footsteps. But I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, if it is not for you because you don't necessarily like the action or the storytelling isn't grabbing you yet, I, ple- I say please give it at least one more episode. See what's going on in episode three, you know. And don't hate it just because it looks different. That's that's my thing. Because if it had if it had truly like critical reasons to be like this is terrible, like go ahead and say this isn't for me. But I will get off my droid shaped soapbox and say Star Wars: The Acolyte. The first two episodes are out streaming now on Disney Plus, and the rest are going to come out weekly. <laughs> 